It's 7.45 in the morning, a year from today, 2019. You're on your way to work. You're on your way to get a cup of coffee. An email arrives in on your phone. You look down, you see it's from the CEO. You open the email, obviously, and in the email, he's outlining that he'd like you to start ROI reporting across all talent management initiatives. Not only that, but he'd like you to start reporting this information to the board and possibly work with a management consultant to get it, to get it done. Wow, big, a big request. Can this be done? Your question's going through your head. You know, how do I approach this? Where do I start? Is my job in question here? So this is a reality that, that if it hasn't arrived, it's on its way. And I suppose why, you ask the question, why has, has, has L&D all of a sudden been put under this type of, of requirement? Um, it hasn't traditionally been, been asked of. Well, there's a lot of changes coming. And it's right across the board, it's right across the, the globe. Um, but when you look at, at, learning, at learning in particular, you know, it, the, the, the changes are coming around measure, train and perform. And I'm Austin Kenny from ETU and this is what we live and breathe. So the changes. Well, if you just look at the investment in learning tech over the last 20 years, you can see the trend. You can see why C CLOs are, are saying that they are concerned with technology. You can see it because in 2017 alone, 9.5 billion was invested in, in private money into learning technology companies. And it is said already in 2018, it has risen above 8 billion and we're not through the year yet. Exponential growth, with exponential growth, comes disruption. Disruption is here. And these are the types of things that will be around the disruption. Because this is what technology does. Measure impact. So, data. That's, this is the key to it. It's, it's getting your finger on the pulse. It's understanding where, where behaviours and skills are. So with, the, with this kind of advancement, you know, th this is what the industry has the capability of doing. And in this presentation, you're going to hear the ways on which you can go about measuring behavior accurately, repeatedly, in a formulaic way. But it also strips it back to, to really understanding the process in the organization that you may need to go through to get buy-in, to influence, which is also a big, from the CLO Symposium report, it's also a big uh, requirement or uh, skill that's needed by the CLO, is influence. So how are we gonna go about this? Well, look, everybody that's listening to this is in the top 1%. We, we all get this, you know, we live and breathe learning. You're either CLOs, you're on a track to be a CLO, you, you want to be a CLO, you may not have the title of CLO, but you act like a CLO. So what I'm about to present to you is, is almost like our checklist in terms of the things that you need to be thinking about as you go through the formula of, of getting to data. So the first is engage learners. You know this. The learning's got to be realistic, it's got to resonate with the learner, and it's got to be immersive in order to get to big data. The learning has got to be highly effective. So it's got to, uh, the learner's got to see consequences based on the decisions that they make in the learning. And those consequences, they have got to be accountable to. So there's got to be a personalised learning path based on the skills and competencies of that learner as they're going through the learning. 
and it must relate. It must relate to their, their situation, their role, so it resonates with them. So this personalized learning path you know, if, if the personalized learning path, they don't, it doesn't resonate with them, that they don't see that their, their skills and competencies are, are being measured correctly, the impact, they won't buy into it. So it has to resonate. Once you have these two, this is when accurate data measurement comes into play. But you've also got the, to have the ability of being able to process this data in real time. The learner has to, has to, has to resonate with the learner again, the, the data points that, that are being reflected to them in terms of their skills and behaviours, but also the organisation. Like This is a huge benefit to the organisation in terms of talent planning, learning strategy, and getting to ROI reporting. It is the three-part formula, which we'll come back to. Where, are we, where, where were we for the last 100 years, and where are we now with this type of innovation? Well, the last 100 years, you know, face-to-face, stand-up in the classroom has served us well. But what did it give us? What did it actually give us in terms of the understanding of what's happening on the learner side? Happy sheets? Bums on seats? Hours of, of training? But what is that giving you? It's just not good enough. The new world is able to measure lots of, of data points because we're, you're able to track and, and, and see where learners are going, not just on one, but on everyone, on thousands. So we're able to track to skills and behaviours, we're able to see uh, the, the process in which thousands of learners are going through lear learning, where the, where the decisions that are, are th like a heat map, where the, the, the hot points are in the learning of where learners are struggling the most, the most amount of learning, giving you the capability to spend the resources in the right areas by empirical data, backed up evidence, which is what the organisation needs. It's able to look at control groups, look at control groups with the learning, without the learning, and see the impact. It's able to, to gather this data to see where the gaps are in the talent holistically about where the organisation needs to focus for the future. It's able to, to uh, give you your learning strategy, point you in the direction, again, backed up by empirical data. It's able to tie to the CEO strategic initiatives so you can, you can have a seat at the table where you're having a seat at the table and it's backed up by data. And then finally getting to that ROI reporting and measuring business impact. It's a very exciting time. So the road to get there. The road to get there, what we've done is we've kind of broken it down so that it makes it digestible. If you're on this road, if you've already started this road on your own, if you've already um, received the email from someone in the, in the organization to do ROI reporting, we want to give you the roadmap to getting there. The road ahead, it, it's exciting. Um, you know, you've got your old world and now we're transitioning and, and have been transitioning to the new world and the, the exponentiality in terms of the quantum of data that's at our fingertips to be able to process in real time is just such an exciting space. And I suppose I'd like to take this opportunity now to invite Maria McMahon, who's from ETU, uh, recently joined uh, to the stage and say a few words. I suppose, is this a reality, uh, Maria? from your experience, and, and please introduce yourself. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, yeah, it's definitely a reality. Um, so for the last decade or so, I've been working with your peers, your colleagues um, within LND, and the thing that comes up over and over again is, you know, we spend all this money on all of our learning programs. How do we know they're making an impact? How do we know we're driving performance? So, um, yeah, it's definitely a real reality. Some of the issues about having ROI and it being credible with L&D is a whole other story sometimes. Um, so, you know, when you look at 
ROI in, you know, in business, you know, how do we tie that to learning and, and, and development? Um, the data, it really comes down to what kind of data are you collecting? Um, to Austin's point before, you know, we don't care about smile sheets. It's great that they liked it, that's okay, but how is that really moving the needle? And does our CEO care about that? So it's really looking at the data and then being able to interpret the data. So what we found is that there's so much data today um, and it's coming in from all different areas of the business, right? But how do we take that data? How do we interpret that data and make sense of that data to show the alignment to the business and show that we are driving performance and we're making a business impact? Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Maria. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks. I'm now going to invite Patty Aquero, who is the uh, managing director or executive manager, should I say, of L&D in BNY Mellon. So thanks, Patty, for joining me. Thank you, Austin. So, Patty, I suppose it'd be great to give everybody uh, a feel of the journey with ETU and uh, where are you now and where are you going to? Sure, sure. Thank you again. Um, for us, I would say the journey really began in 2013 when uh, the company decided to centralize all of its uh, L&D. At that point, having come out of the financial crisis, there was a big focus on risk culture. And by centralizing L&D, we took the opportunity to focus on how we could use training to foster the risk culture. And so we began that journey uh, in 2013. I looked at how I could really uh, develop a plan, a strategy, and we, we took a two-pronged approach. We wanted to deliver programs that, uh, of course, covered the all employees, built some foundation, but we also wanted to target managers uh, who we felt could set the tone for the company and, of course, have that message cascade uh, throughout their teams. So we picked a scenario that actually took place in the bank. Uh, there was an operational error which resulted in a financial loss, and we built a virtual training classroom around that scenario. We got great feedback. However, it took us several months to train roughly about 1,000 managers, and we had another 5,000 to go. Uh, we also were challenged by having a global company uh, and trying to reach those audiences. So we engaged with ETU to take that virtual training program and really create a sim. And that uh, launched in 2015 as managing risk in your team. And overnight, what we got was a program that was delivered to 5,000 managers. Uh, we were able to redirect our resources who were doing all of the virtual training. And most importantly, we actually got data. And we were able to look at and analyze the results that employees took throughout the training program, which was fascinating. We then used that data to drive forward, uh, we looked for opportunities where we had existing programs. Uh, some of the behaviors we were looking at were critical thinking, communication. So we looked at what we had in our inventory and we were able to uh, push that out uh, in areas where we saw some suboptimal uh, choices by employees. And, but most importantly, we took that and we used it to develop our next SIM, uh, which was called if uh, effective risk management for managers. And what was so interesting about that was, again, we started with a scenario that took place at the bank. But what we did in this version was take the scenario and play it out over three modules, which was fascinating. It gave the employee the opportunity in each module to, to see the scenario from a different perspective. So they were able to play the relationship manager the operational manager, and then the risk manager. And as the scenario played out, they were making those key decisions throughout the uh, program. We got tremendous results, again, really engaged uh, learners, uh, and really, really high scores in terms of, of feedback. Um, this also just played in that journey in terms of being able to analyze the data. So not only did we have managing risk in your team, 
but now we have three addi additional modules to actually track the trends. So it's been very, very much a successful uh, journey for us. It's interesting, Paddy, as you as you went through that, like, and you go back to that, you know, the the three part formula, and the you know the the journey that and the data and the the engagement that you saw, like, I suppose to, to give everybody a bit of a sense, it was a risk and compliance program, and it, we get a bad rap. <laughs> <laughs> and from an engagement perspective, like, what what did you see? Yeah, I mean, and that that is what's fascinating because you know they're they're is not a lot of excitement typically around risk and compliance programs. The fact that people were so engaged and really to me the, uh, the biggest sign was that after we trained the 6,000 managers for effective risk management for managers, they actually asked us to take that program and roll it out to their teams. So we took the program designed for 6,000 managers and rolled it out to another 10,000 employees the next year because it was so well received. Uh, my, my partners in risk and compliance are, uh, were extremely happy and proud and, and heard all of the same really positive feedback. It was brilliant, and and I suppose it, so. That was like as the three part formula. That was really kind of honing in on part one, and um, part two in terms of the effectiveness of it. Like even as you're describing it, there, you know, the thing, the journey that you went on from the first program managing risk in your team to effective risk management for managers. You know, it was that data that was then pointing you uh, to the, the the learning strategy that that you needed to do. I suppose that. That was just, it's just kind of following on to, to and summing up around that. And I suppose now, now that you're, you're where you are and we want to get to the data measurement and the ROI reporting, what's in your head and where are you going as an organization around that? Well, where we are is, is obviously monitoring the trends yeah. where we've analyzed uh, where uh, we've seen improvement. And even within the three SIMs, uh, you can actually see the behaviors improving, um, which, is, which is fascinating. Where we are now is we want to use that uh, data and continue the trend and really look at where we can correlate that data to other uh, metrics or other points uh, within the organization. Uh, there are probably uh, really key points like attrition or um, even even performance, but also from the business uh, KPIs or areas where there might be operational losses. So the the real goal is to to tie the data correlated to those other metrics to really make sense of where we need to go as an organization. So, so if this email lands, I know it hasn't landed with you yet, but if this email was to land, what would your reaction be? Well, we're actually prepared, uh, yeah. so I would be able to have my coffee and, and, <laughs> and enjoy it, but uh, we're really looking at this as something that, again, because we're in the risk and compliance space, We've been hearing that the regulators are interested in this. I think Maria said uh, we're away from just completion rates, and I think the regulators get that. Yeah. We, we are not looking at just measuring um, time and seat and uh, completion rates, but we really want to look at measurement. And I think also in the financial uh, institutions, I think uh, um, having a risk culture audit is becoming much more common, yeah. and these metrics will support um, you know, when we get audited, how we can how we can look at the risk culture across the organization. So, we're we have a story. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Well, thanks a million, Paddy. Thanks for joining me up here. Thanks, Austin. Yeah, take care, take care. I'd like to now invite uh, Brenda Sugru, the Global Chief Learning Officer of EY. Hi, Hi Brenda. Austin. How nice to be here today. Great, Great. Brenda. Thanks for joining us. Um, so Brenda, I suppose uh, a similar start, you know, how, what's your journey with ETU been like and where are you now and, and where are you going to? Thanks, Austin. Well, at EY, we invest heavily both in the effective design of our instruction in the first place, and secondly, in measuring, particularly measuring its impact on the business. And I think two challenges ETU have really helped us with two things. 
One is the effective instruction because effective instruction, it requires practice and monitoring of the practice and correction of errors with feedback. And what the ETU platform has enabled us to do is to provide at scale opportunities for people to practice things like role-playing conversations with employees or with clients. And then in real time, getting the feedback, where did they go wrong, seeing uh, the better way to do it, and gradually improving their process within these micro simulations, which we can deliver online all over the world. So the data from that is very useful because you can see during the learning where people are going wrong and you can make sure that they all have achieved the right uh, behaviors by the time they go back to the job to do it on the job. Uh, the second thing on the measurement, while we have focused mostly on the, the business impact to date, making sure that the, the big programs that we invest a lot of money in, like our manager training, are having an impact on business outcomes like revenue, client satisfaction, and we do that with control groups, et cetera. Again, the weak link for us was in the, the monitoring of the data during the learning, and I think your platform and your authentic practice allows us to uh, add that data to our complete set of data from going from learning all the way through to application and impact. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, Freda. And just uh, one question about the engagement, and I know you, you, you just did an, a big initiative uh, analysis, uh, looking at the analytics around the engagement. Do you want to say a few words on that? Well, certainly uh, the learning it sh itself should be engaging. It's yeah. not like you have to, and when you, when you move to more uh, experiential and practice oriented, it's automatically engaging because they're doing real tasks and it feels real. Uh, but if we want to measure, say, engagement separately, I guess we still look at those smile sheets. We, we actually do. And at EY, we have boiled those down to just four questions, the four questions that have been found to actually correlate with business impact. And those are the relevance, confidence, um, intent to apply, and then perceived value of the experience. And we're getting really high scores across all of our programs. I think we get something like 4.5 on average across all of our courses on a five-point scale. Then when, we, when you look at employee engagement, ideally the learning and development should be contributing to the employee's overall experience and engagement at the firm. And when we look at questions on our engagement survey that, that ask about um, how, how have you, uh, are, to what extent are, are you being provided with good opportunities to learn that improve your, your performance and your experience? We're, get, we're seeing an uptick tick in those uh, results as well. For example, in the, the mid 70s going up to the, the 80s uh, in satisfaction. Excellent, excellent. And, and just to, to kind of wrap up, I suppose, it, it, and I know what you're going to say here, if the email landed with you uh, around ROI reporting, what would, you, what, would you, what would go through your head? Well, I would say we are ready, Austin, <laughs> for that email, and we have been proactive even before the email ever landed. We have been doing our due diligence behind the scenes and gathering our data and making sure that we have our metrics. In fact, when I go to the board, I bring the metrics already, and so they, they know that the learning we're designing and delivering is having an impact on the business, and also that it is engaging and that it is uh, very effective and learners are uh, demonstrating demonstrating the behaviours during the kinds of uh, practice simulations that, that we use. Great. Thanks, thanks Brenda, for thanks, joining Austin. us today. Thank you very take, much. Yep, yeah, take care. So uh, just to kind of wrap up, um, is this a reality? I think there, there you have the, the evidence that this is a reality. This is here and uh, we're really looking forward to the years ahead. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>